He is my Lord, the Lord of the world. From him is set in Lebanonis, by the incenses of the Lord, the very scriptures in his prayer. How sweet the mercy of the Lord, the friend of the Lord,
suffered the three years to birth and death. To birth and death. To birth and death. Yada. Yada. As soon as. As soon as. as. Tiakta. Tiakta. Giving up. Giving up. Samasta. Samasta. Oh. Oh. Uh, karmaha. Karmaha. Creativity. The Vedita Atma. The Vedita Atma. The fully surrendered soul. The fully surrendered soul. Michi Krishita. Michi Krishita. The desire to act. The desire to act. Me. Me. By me. By me. Tada. Tada. At that time. At that time. Amitatum. Amitatum. Immortality. Immortality. Dati Paya Adayamanaha. Dati Adayamanaha. Attain. Maya. Maya. With me. Atma Vyaya. Atma Vyaya. For becoming of a similar nature. For becoming of a similar nature. Cha. Cha. Also. Also. Kalpate. Kalpate. Is eligible. Is eligible. By. Certainly. Certainly. Translation. The living entity who is subjected to birth and death attains immortality when he gives up all material activities, dedicates his life to the execution of my order, and acts according to my directions. In this way, he becomes fit to enjoy the spiritual bliss derived from exchanging loving mellows with me. This is a quotation from Srimad Bhagavatam, 11th Canto, 29th chapter, verse uh, 34. At the time of initiation, a devotee gives up all his material conceptions. Therefore, being in touch with the Supreme Personality of Godhead, he is situated on the transcendental platform. And thus, having attained knowledge and, and the spiritual platform, he always engages in the service of the spiritual body of Krishna. When one is freed from material concept connections in this way, his body immediately becomes spiritual and Krishna accepts his service. However, Krishna does not accept anything from a person with a material conception of life. When a devotee no longer has any desire for material sense gratification, in his spiritual identity, he engages in the service of the Lord, for his dormant spiritual consciousness awakens. This awakening of spiritual consciousness makes the, his body spiritual, and thus he becomes fit to render service to the Lord. Karmis may consider the body of a devotee material, but factually it is not. For a devotee has no conception of material enjoyment. If one thinks that the body of a pure devotee is material, he is an offender, for that is a Vaishnava Parada. In this connection, one should consult Srila Sanatana Goswami's Vrikha Bhagavatam Gita, uh, 1345 and 23139, which I did, and we will read it afterwards. Om Gyanati Nandasya Vinajana Shalakaya Chakshu Nuritam Natasvai Shri Kuravita. Hey Krishna Karma Sindhu Dina Bhandu Jagatpate Yopesha Vipika Kanta Rada Kanta Namaste. Tapta Kanchana Gorenge Radhe Vindaveshwari Vishabhanu Sutta Devi Pranamani Hare Priya Mancha Kalpa Tari Vesha Kripa Sindhu Vyari Vasha Pati Tata Kanta Hare Priya Vaishnavi Vyanamaha Jai Shri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhuni Tiananda Shri Adveta Gadagra Shri Vasadi Guru Bhakta Vinda Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama So this chapter, um, to get a little bit, a little introduction, is a chapter when Sanatana Goswami visits the Lord, and um, and uh, while he he is going to Jagannath Puri to see Sri Krishna Chaitanya, he is going through the forest of Jagannath. I also get the forest Jagannath. Yes, thank you. So 
So, and there he drinks some um, dirty water, and then uh, he be his body becomes ill, and he has sores on his body uh, through which uh, mucus uh, is uh, going. So he finds his body very much contaminated, and he also finds it like he cannot do any even the devotional service with uh, with his body. So he's so fallen. So then he decides that he will anyway go to Jagannath Puri, but then he has a desire to commit suicide because he wants to make his uh, life successful in that way. And he decides that he will uh, throw himself in front of the car of uh, Lord Jagannath uh, in front of Lord Chaitanya. So he will have an auspicious death because he will be in a holy dam and he will have in front of him a vision of Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. And uh, this is something uh, when he and then he comes there and uh, he he stays at Haridas Stakur's place and he gets every day visited by Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. And then in one instance, uh, Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu uh, reveals to him that he actually knows his intentions and that uh, he knows that he was he was uh, he wanted to kill himself. And then he says that uh, you are actually not allowed to do that because. Uh, uh, your body, because you already surrendered unto me, and your body belongs to me. And in a sense, he says that your body belongs to me because I have to stay here in Jagannath Puri because of the desire of my mother. So I have to be here because I promised to her. But I want to preach in Vindal. I want to. Uh, I want to uh, excavate the lost places of uh, Krishna's pastimes. I want to establish temples. And I want to propagate Krishna consciousness in the place where actually Krishna came uh, to perform his pastimes. So I want to do it through you. Um, and then, um, and so in a way, this chapter talks about the body of a devotee. What does it mean in our spiritual life? So in a, in a way, so before. Uh, when Krishna Chaitanya, uh, when he says, your body belongs to me, it's like, it means that we surrender uh, to Krishna and therefore our body becomes an instrument of his will. Why? Because uh, we actually employ our, our, our senses in Krishna's service, right? And I always mention the example of Ambarish Maharaj. He's like something uh, with which we can uh, connect because he was, uh, a person who had a material life in the sense he was a king, um, so he was not living in the temple. This may, for me, some people here live in the temple, but most, mostly today people are grihastas, so they have some kind of an income and they work. But still, they, they use their income for the service of Krishna, they use their body uh, for the service of Krishna. It was described that Ambarish Maharaj would use his legs to go uh, to the holy places and to visit holy places. He used his legs to go uh, to the temple and uh, he used his hands to worship the deity of Krishna. He used his mind to think always of Krishna, his lips to talk about always about Krishna and to eat prasada. So in that, in that sense, the body of a devotee um, is an instrument of Krishna because it is engaged in his service. And uh, here, in the verse before, Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu said because uh, Sanatana Goswami was very much ashamed of his sick body and he didn't want Chaitanya Mahaprabhu to embrace him, which he did oftentimes every time he would see Sanatana Goswami, he would become happy and jubilant and wanted to embrace him because he's his devotee. And Sanatana Goswami didn't like that because he was thinking that he was making offenses by this because for him Chaitanya Mahaprabhu had a beautiful transcendental body which was spiritual and now it was by hugging, by, by Chaitanya Mahaprabhu hugging him, he was actually contaminating him. So, so then he again lamented and he thought that his life was not successful again because he was again making offenses. So, so for him it was very hard. But then um, he told that to Chaitanya Mahaprabhu and uh, in the verse before, the verses we read now, Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu said, the body of a devotee is never material. It is considered to be transcendental, full of spiritual bliss. And therefore, that is the reason why Chaitanya Mahaprabhu will always embrace his devotees, no matter what the condition of their body is, 
that's one uh, reason or argument. And the other is that we also should not look at devotees uh, in material conception of, uh, of how their body looks like. They're always transcendental because, I mean, their body is always transcendental. And they are situated on transcendental platform because they are engaged in the service of Krishna. And now we can begin with our uh, verses, uh, where uh, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu says that at a time of initiation, when a devotee fully surrenders unto the service of the Lord, Krishna accepts him to be as good as himself. And he also says that the devotee's body is then thus transformed into spiritual existence. The devotee in that transcendental body renders service to the lotus feet of the Lord. So this transcendental body that uh, is mentioned here is actually our spiritual body. And uh, then I, I investigated a little bit what Srila Prabhupada says about a spiritual body. First of all, we know that the second chapter of the Bhagavad Gita is where the soul is described. So we are all actually spiritual sparks. So that is also what Srila Prabhupada says. And um, so this spiritual spark is the one who, yeah, the one who produces this material body uh, according to the desires that we have. And these desires are always sanctioned by the super soul from Krishna. So, is both our desires and his sanction according to our activities that we get this material body. But what Srila Prabhupada said is that we also have a spiritual body. And this spiritual body is uh, always here. It's not something that we will gain. Um, like through the, I mean, we will awaken it through the process of Krishna consciousness. But this body is here and then he gives actually a very nice example uh, where he says that uh, as the body, uh, as the spirit soul uh, changes uh, his body, like uh, a person changes his clothes, that's how we have like, like this body is this uh, cloth that we just throw away, we take a new one, we throw away, we take a new one. But the form that we have um, of this body is actually the form of the spiritual body. Uh, Srila Prabhupada says that impersonalists are the ones who, wants to stay, who want to stay as a spiritual spark. They will not develop a spiritual body in a sense because it's like their desire not to have, even though they do have a spiritual body because according to our constitutional position, that is what we are, what we have. Because Sanatana Dharma, uh, which means the constitutional position of, this, uh, of, uh, of the jiva, is that he renders a loving service to the Supreme Lord. So even though someone is an impersonalist and he wants to become a spiritual spark, which you have, which is described in Srimad Bhagavatam, when they describe Brahma, Brahma Loka, where Brahma lives, it says that it's full of these spiritual sparks, and some of these spiritual sparks and lights are those impersonalists. But because our constitutional nature is that we also need ananda, which is bliss, these spiritual sparks will fall uh, and they will continue uh, to perform certain activities. In the beginning there will be material activities because they just the, the essence of the soul is that the soul is always active. So so like that is the result that they will have. And in the end, the Bhagavad Gita anyway says that uh, they all will achieve perfection one day. Some of us will achieve perfection in spiritual life earlier, and some will just require more time, which is so, nothing is ever lost, in a way. But what Srila Prabhupada says is that we as devotees of Krishna, we desire a spiritual body that has hands, that has legs, that has a mouth, because we want to serve with this senses the Supreme Personality of Godhead. And these senses are transcendental senses. And as it is described in the scriptures, um, so I forgot exactly, I think 78 or 79, or maybe 80% the jiva of the qualities of Krishna, the jiva possesses. And so the jiva possesses also the spiritual body, which is Sachit Ananda. And this spiritual body also has 
similar qualities to the body of Krishna. And we know that Krishna, when he accepts, for instance, the food that we prepare for him, he eats with, he can eat with his eyes. And so in the same sense, even though there are like different parts of the spiritual body that we will have as jivas, we will be able to perform everything with those senses, uh, also in the service of Krishna. So uh, that's why it is said that uh, that if you want to self-real, if you if you meditate also on yourself and knowing yourself, you can also know God in a way because you have the qualities of God. And when Srila Prabhupada uh, talks about it, he compares the jiva uh, with the drop of the ocean and Krishna to the ocean. So the drop of the ocean has all the qualities uh, of the ocean itself, all the ingredients, but just in a minor uh, way. So, so <coughs> we will get the spiritual body. But what is interesting is that um, what these verses say is that at the time of initiation, actually, we Krishna accepts us as as equal, not e as good as, to be as good as himself, and. Actually, at the time of initiation, in a way, if you read these verses, you can conclude that you have a spiritual body. Because uh, <coughs> you have to be on the spiritual platform to perform uh, service to Krishna. And that is something that I found uh, also in Bhagavad Gita. Uh, in uh, chapter 14, verse 26. Um, this chapter... Um, actually is about Arjuna asking three questions and getting answers to it. His three questions are what are the symptoms of a person who, who is situated on transcendental platform? The second question is what is um, how does this person act? Like these symptoms are what we actually what we can perceive for ourselves. So other persons cannot perceive these symptoms because it is something that is internal. And uh, the other question that concerns the activities of a person who is situated on transcendental platform concerns what activities he performs. It's many times Arjuna actually has this question in Bhagavad Gita when he says, how does this person sit? How does he walk? So this is how we can also see this person or recognize it. And then Krishna describes it. But then, and he's fascinated, I mean, everyone is fascinated by this, and then he uh, actually, he, he uh, of course wants to know, how can I get to this platform? And this is where Krishna uh, answers, uh, you know, how to get on this platform, and we all know how to get on this platform. So I can ask you how to get on this platform. Transcendental uh, only service to me. It's actually very easy, we practice it every day. It's bhakti yoga. <laughs> I mean, that's the only way. Uh, Krishna, said, uh, Krishna says, and Prabhupada says that all the other ways can lead one to maybe become aware that he has to serve Krishna, but in the end everyone has to surrender before him in bhakti yoga. So. Which chapter? Can you repeat it? Yeah. Chapter 14, uh, verse 26. Yeah. Um, so Arjuna says, well, sorry, Krishna says. <coughs> So, 
So we have to perform bhakti yoga and we have to be in equality with Krishna. What also Srila Prabhupada emphasized that we should not mistake this equality with Krishna as being equal with Krishna. Because for bhakti yoga we need three things. Uh, and that things are connected to individuality. We need a Supreme Personality of Godhead, Krishna, of course. We need a, a Jiva, which is also an individual. And between them, there has to be a certain relationship. And that's, therefore, in Bhakti Yoga, we have all these rasas. So, so this is like, equality in service actually means that um, that is something that Sri Shopanishad talks about. Um, it's, uh, which mantra? So it's a mantra that talks about actually the equal vision that a Mahatma should have. But when Srila Prabhupada explains this ekat, ekat, when he talks about that, uh, then he says that, okay, we should have this vision that everyone is equal because everyone is part and parcel of Krishna. But this equality also means, uh, not equality, but oneness. This oneness means oneness in desire. <coughs> so, uh, which actually means that uh, we, we do everything in Bhakti Yoga to please Krishna because in the end we know that what pleases Him will bring happiness to us. So, because we, we, we are always pleasure seeking, that's why we are performing this Bhakti Yoga. Because this pleasure that we are seeking from, that we are seeking, can be found in performing this devotional service to Krishna. And therefore, this oneness with God is oneness in interest and oneness in desire. So, basically, we as devotees perform devotional service uh, according to the instructions of uh, Krishna, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, or of course our spiritual master, which is who is a representative of Krishna. So, and all these um, instructions are actually the will of Krishna. So that, in that sense, there is like oneness of intention and oneness of desire. And when we have this desire to please Krishna with our senses, then we are actually situated on this transcendental platform. And um, how do we come there? Uh, he says, uh, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu says, at the time of initiation. And then Nityananda uh, Kari, David Asi, she gave me a one essay uh, that I would like to share with you, which was written by Bhakti Yunotaku, and it's called Pancha Samskara. So there are like uh, five samskaras in the process of initiation that we should get to actually become eligible to worship Krishna. Uh, the first samskara is uh, Tapa. So I will first list all of them. So there is Tapa, Pundra, Nama, Mantra, and Yaga. And they're all connected in the process of initiation. And even though they are manifested externally, I will explain in which way, they, sh they are also something that, uh, that, the that the result that we get from it has to be internal. So it's like when we talk about that it's not enough for a devotee to put a tilak on his forehead and have kuntimala and jaka faces, like where is our inner uh, attitude and meditation. So this tapa, which I, I personally didn't see <laughs> yet uh, as an example, uh, is that we mark the body with uh, harinama using sandalwood paste. So, I don't know, do you have experience with Because I don't see you want to do that uh, here in the temple. But this also is like uh, something which will be given by the spiritual master um, in, the, in this trial process of one year. So when we approach, when we want to serve Krishna more, and when we want to become more qualified in our service to Krishna, and when we want to surrender to Krishna fully, then we approach a spiritual master. And that spiritual master will observe our behavior for, for a year. And, uh, 
and in this observation, then he will conclude if we are qualified to have this initiation or not. And also what Bhakti Vinod says, that externally we will receive this tapa in the sense that we can mark our body with Harinam, uh, uh, Harinam like words and everything using some of the paste. But internally, what we have to do during this time is like to repent um, for what we did. Because when we take our vows during initiation, we say that we will, uh, not in, uh, so there will be no intoxication, no illicit sex, no gambling, and uh, yeah, we did it. So, so if a person did it before, so she, she or he has to contemplate about it and like repent. And this is like one samskara. So the external one, when you receive it, when you're marking on your body, an internal one where you have this internal process in yourself, like why you are surrendering, surrendering and why you are repenting. <coughs> then the second samskara is punya. So uh, this means that we mark our body with tilak. Um, so externally, we mark our body with tilak. Externally, uh, internally, uh, we meditate that we are the servant of Krishna. Is das or dasi, and that this tilak also represents the footprints of Krishna on our body. That so this is what Chaitanya Mahaprabhu actually said. When we surrender, then this uh, it's like in the example of Bali Maharaj also when uh, Vamanadev put his, his foot on his head. This was like the symbolized uh, the surrender of the body also to Krishna Chaitanya. So this marking of tilak on our body means that our body is the temple of Vishnu. And uh, in a way it should be used for his service. The third samskara that we receive in the process of initiation, and yes, what is also important when in this uh, verse 192, when, the, when Chaitanya Mahaprabhu Prabhu talks about initiation, he talks about diksha. And we know that Diksha at that time meant Brahma, second initiation, Brahma initiation, not the high initiation, because Srila Prabhupada was the one who, who made it like a more, uh, like uh, emphasized it, uh, which is true, as a very, very important samskara, but what will be explained in the following thoughts that I have to share with you is that we need more than that, and I will also explain why. So, so the third samskara is na or name. So this, in this samskara, our spiritual master, uh, he gives us uh, the holy name of the Lord, so we can chant and purify ourselves. And he also gives us a spiritual name, so we can identify ourselves as a servant of Krishna. And so we can always be reminded that we are a servant of Krishna and that others remind us that we are uh, the servant of Krishna. But also, I had a lot of questions about this because I was reading before uh, the book uh, Vayatri Mantra of Suchinanda Swami. And there I because I was wondering, why is Vayatri Mantra? Why, why, why do you need it for second initiation? Because anyway, we have the holy name, and the holy name is so pure, and uh, it can liberate us, and so on. And then my spiritual master, he told me that, uh, that, uh, that yes, that what is said in the scriptures about the holy name is correct. And the holy name, of course, has all this potency that are mentioned in the scriptures. But <laughs> we need more, we need, need these like, uh, tools to purify us, uh, to, 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 to make us realize the holy name more, and so that the holy name can have even better potency on us with these purificatory processes that I'm going to talk about. So there are some people who will make it, let's say it like that. They will be able to turn the pure name of the Lord. But at least for me, I know how difficult it is to control my mind. So I can be grateful if I, I chant sometimes the holy name without offenses. But I think that I chant every time. <laughs> and that's a little bit scary. Um, yeah. For me, it's scary because I, you know, I would wish I could chant like Bhakti Nirmala Kuru, but that's I don't know if it's going to happen. 
But anyway, the point is we need more. We need, uh, we need help to be more purified. So this was the third samskar. And the fourth samskar is the month. So that actually represents um, this second initiation. When we are given the 18 syllable mantra, which is a Gopal mantra, which uh, second initiate people know more than I do. I don't have a second initiation, but I'm always interested like, to know why. So, so this uh, mantra is given to us by, with a purpose. And the purpose is to get this fifth samskara, which is called Yaga, and which represents deity worship. So with this 18 syllable mantra, which is a Gopal mantra, we can then worship Vishalakam Shiva or a deity of Krishna. And that is very important because in this deity worship, what Bhakti Vinod Thakur says, it's here our personal service to God starts, which is like very interesting. So actually, um, yeah, we should, uh, we should meditate. Uh, on that, on those things, and also what is very, very important is that scriptures, when they talk about devotees, and uh, especially here when they say, oh, but you know, by initiation, you will get a spiritual body. You have also in. I just took this just to remember that. Looks like the book. So in our big down part of Mahatma. You have a description of the uh, as a spiritual place, and also you have a description of all the persons that live there, that the demigods see them as uh, that they have four hands, like uh, residents of Vaikuntha, and that they are blackish uh, in their color. So what I'm trying to say is that uh, some of us might be there uh, in Mayapur and live there, and this is how we are seen through the scriptures. And this is also, so in this verse, uh, 194, when Srila uh, Prabhupada says that we should consult Srila Sanatana Goswami's Prihat Bhagavatam Vita in the connection that uh, the devotees receive a transcendental body in which they can serve Krishna, because Krishna cannot accept the service of the one who has material conception, which actually means that the one who, does, uh, who doesn't have a spiritual body and then there is an explanation what it means to have a spiritual body. And Srila Prabhupada gives a definition. To have a spiritual body means to be engaged in devotional service. So, so basically, this is like my confirmation because we should not accept things blindly in Krishna consciousness, right? So we have this statement that after initiation, uh, we get a spiritual body. We should make a research, at least I think like that. Like, what does it mean? Because bhakti yoga process is the process of emotions, but it's also a scientific process. So we should understand why Chaitanya Mahaprabhu said that. And I found out why in this Pancha Samskara. So there it was explained what it means to uh, have initiation, what are the qualifications of a person to receive this initiation, what is uh, actually his internal, internal mood, like what, she, uh, what actually Krishna talks about in this chapter 14. Uh, so what are the symptoms of a person situated on the transcendental platform? So internal moves, that is something we cannot see. It's something that we have to perceive and discriminate by ourselves. And then how does he act? External, um, external marks, which, uh, yeah, which we have. And uh, how to get this by the devotional service. And then he says why I mentioned this deity worship as very important uh, in mentioning these pancha, uh, pancha samskaras and telling how sometimes the holy name is not enough because we need uh, help for purification. But Sivina Thakur says that without pancha samskara, a person cannot develop devotion, which is also like, <laughs> so, I mean, for me, that means like, okay, I have to do more, I have to chant more, I have to surrender more, because uh, even though I have a hari on initiation, so this chanting of the holy name of, uh, of, of Krishna, still I, I cannot personally serve uh, the deity as Pujari, but I can do some other stuff. I'm just saying like how <coughs> still there is, there is a need in my qualification, in my purification to go near and near. And also what I found very nice is what's also written in uh, Shri Shopanishad about the deity worship. because. There actually, yeah, I think, I don't know, yeah, Bhakti Vinod Thakur, he says that 
some persons or Kalisha Bukharis, that means devotees. Some persons think, devotees think, I guess, that uh, the deity is just uh, something that's made of stone. They don't have the perception that it's actually uh, really, really Krishna. And then I found uh, this amazing, <coughs> amazing, amazing uh, purport of Shiva Prabhupada uh, that he gave on Mantra 8. And she is Upanishad and it talks about the deity and it's really beautiful. And I will share it with you. So the Lord's worshipable form, Archavigraha, which is installed in the temples by authorized acharyas, who have realized the Lord in terms of Mantra 7, which means that they have equal vision of everyone, is not different from the original form of the Lord. The Lord's original form is that of Sri Krishna. And Sri Krishna expands himself into unlimited number of forms, such as Baladeva, Rama, Yasimha, and Varaha. All of these forms are one and the same personality of Godhead. Similarly, the Archavigraha worshipped in temples is also an expanded form of the Lord. By worshipping the Archavigraha, one can at once approach the Lord, who accepts the service of the devotee by his omnipotent energy. The Archavigraha of the Lord descends at the request of the Acharyas. So I, I find it amazing because you know, Shiva Prabhupada, he, he uh, preached in the West and wherever he came, he wanted to uh, establish a temple. And then, and you know that when he came, he was the one who, uh, who said, Krishna, please come and install the deities. So it was by his power that those deities, all of them came. And of course, he authorized others, devotees who were left uh, behind him, or he left this material world to do the same. So it's amazing. And uh, so the Lord descends at the request of the Acharyas, the holy teachers, and works exactly in the original way of the Lord by virtue of the Lord's omnipotence. Foolish people who have no knowledge of Sri Shopanishad or any of the other Shruti mantras. Consider the Archaviraha, which is worshipped by pure devotees, to be made of material elements. This form may be seen as material by imperfect eyes of foolish people or Kanishta and Dikaris. But such people do not know that the Lord, being omnipotent and omniscient, can transform matter into spirit and spirit into matter as he desires. So that is what is beautiful. And sometimes in the scriptures we get this argument like, well, it's inconceivable. And yes, if we want to know Krishna, we have to, as my spiritual master says, says we have to acknowledge the inconceivable potencies of the, of the world. And these inconceivable potencies are usually revealed through time by his mercy. So some things cannot be understood by our senses or our intelligence or our logic. Just He's here uh, as he is in the spiritual world. He came by the request of the Acharyas. And, and he's so kind that he lets us uh, serve him and worship him. And so we should look at it like it's Krishna. And also, this inconceivable potency of the Lord is manifested in a devotee of the Lord. Uh, Shiva Prabhupada says that, um, and I think it's a very nice analogy, of iron and the fire. Why? I think it's nice. Because we say, and the Shastra says, says that this body is dead. dead matter, and that without consciousness, without spirit, so it's nothing, just lying on the ground, it's a bunch of matter, that's it. Yeah, iron is the same, it's like cold and has nothing, <laughs> if it's not like put in the fire where it becomes red and warm, and then if it's in the fire all the time, if you put it somewhere el else, it, uh, it, it acts like fire, it can burn things. And if we want the iron to have the quality of fire all the time, then we have to put the iron in the fire all the time. So the point is that if we want this body to be spiritualized, even though we have a spiritual body, but we have to, like in this process that I described, of initiation and samskaras, and even afterwards, everything is described in Mudhya Kandamini about the process of bhakti. What follows, you can read it there because there's no time to explain everything. Um, but anyway, what uh, Srila Prabhupada says that if you want to get a spiritual body, like fully spiritual body, and if you want to have this body spiritualized, then you have to be in devotional service. 
you have to perform the activities of devotional service constantly. And that's again what is mentioned in this verse 26. It says, one who engages in full devotional service unfailing in all circumstances. So it's, it's a constant like endeavor for it. And this is also something that is confirmed in the verse that we read today. So we will attain, we, the living entity, we will attain immortality <coughs> if we give up all material activities. To give up all material activities does not mean to renounce it and then sit on one place and do nothing, but to perform something positive and that is spiritual activity. Which is later, if we can connect uh, with the, the second sentence, uh, dedicates his life to the execution of my order and acts according to my direction. So in this way, if we engage uh, in these activities where we execute the order of the Lord and where we act according to his directions, which we know from the scriptures and our spiritual master, <coughs> then we become fit <coughs> to enjoy the spiritual bliss derived from exchanging loving knowledge with, with the Supreme Lord. So when we have material conceptions, we cannot serve the Lord. But when we have this oneness of desire uh, that we want to please him, and uh, then we can come in this uh, equality with Krishna and then serve him in love and devotional service. And uh, yeah, so I know I said a lot, but uh, when I read these verses, I was like, oh my God, what do I say about this? <laughs> because it's inconceivable in a way. And then um, maybe my, my spiritual master says sometimes, let the acharyas talk. So what is there for me to say? <laughs> Nothing. I, I'm just in this process. Like, but I can, I, I, for instance, by exploring this topic and by reading these verses, I also learned something and connected some things. And maybe uh, by, by, yeah, certainly by speaking the topics of Krishna and by speaking what Acharyas have said, maybe I'll be able to understand it fully. So it's better always to let the Acharya speak. <laughs> so that's why I shared mostly what, what Bhakti Thakur said and Srila Prabhupada because they are the most qualified to talk about these uh, topics, especially because they have realizations. So, so if you have any questions or comments, you're more than welcome. Oh yeah, okay. <laughs> So, uh, so yeah, I forgot. So, uh, I, yeah, and also I wanted to mention how the pujaris, when they perform the service for the deities, they always, as I understood my friends who explained this to me, when they go, before they go and perform the service, <coughs> they, they, they recite the prayer. I am not a Brahmana, I am not a Kshatriya, I am not a Vaishya or a Shudra, nor I am a Brahmachari, a householder, a Vana Prasta or a Sanyasi. I identify myself only as the servant of the servant of the servant of the lotus feet of Lord Krishna, the maintainer of the gopis. So it's an everyday meditation of uh, people who, as I understood, people who have second initiation, even though everyone should have that meditation. But at least you are maybe forced, let's say forced, just in the, it said that when you go to the to the altar, you have to perform some things. So, so I, I think that's very nice, and uh, it makes you then to identify with other stuff. So yeah. So why did Shiva uh, Prabhupada says that we should refer to Brihad Bhagavat Amrita? Because uh, in this verse that uh, he's uh, giving us uh, as an example that we should look, that verse says. In Vaikuntha, the residents have such Ananda bodies and may avail themselves of the supreme opulence of Lord Hari. They have such Ananda powers equal to his, but the residents of Vaikuntha do not like to accept such equality with the Lord. So, uh, basically, when when Srila Prabhupada or other Acharyas, when they say that, that the, the body of those pure devotee is spiritual, they actually say that his body is Sachitananda and uh, the same as the body in Vaikuntha. And then later on, in Dikhar Bhagavad it is described like the qualities of the messengers from Vaikuntha planets. It says that they 
cherish only devotional service to the Lord. They travel as they please, spreading pure devotional service everywhere. And it's in a way nice because um, it is explained that this Vaikuntha residents actually help pure devotees in their devotional services here on earth because they need help in this Kali Yuga. But the point is that in these verses, verses, the pure devotees are uh, compared to the residents of Vaikuntha by having these bodies. And an example I already gave is in the description of Navadvip, how the demigods see the people who live there, pure devotees. And also the example is given that, uh, that uh, for instance, also in Haya Stakur and everyone else who is pure devotee, of course, uh, they are not, uh, their bodies are not burned when they leave the body, but they are, uh, they, they are uh, put in, into Samadhi because their bodies, hmm? yeah, because their bodies are, are spiritual. So they have nothing to do with this um, material world. And what was also very interesting is that uh, this uh, sentence that uh, the residents of Vaikuntha do not, do not like to accept such equality with the Lord. So this is something that's, that they are talking about the residents of Vaikuntha. But the point is that the scriptures see pure devotees as I described, but the pure devotee would never say that he has a spiritual body. He would always think of himself as a Kanishta Adhikari, not qualified to do anything for the Lord. And we can see it in the next example of Sanatana Goswami, who thought that everything he did, and his whole body, and his birth, nothing was qualified to serve the Lord. He, he thought that he was only committing offenses. <coughs> so that's one thing. And um, also, it's very interesting that it's also found in the Bhikkhat Bhagavatamrita. So uh, that devotion, these external, internal things in the service of the Lord. Um, devotional service appears to new servants of the Lord to be a function of their own senses, body and mind, so that such new parts can engage in devotional service with relish, as they should. <coughs> so at the beginning we get this help, like, you know, sometimes I feel like I have to do a lot of activities because if I do a lot of physical activities, then I think I'm uh, engaged in devotional service. And sometimes what I do is like exhaust my body. But then I, uh, I, I found uh, a quote, which I'm not going to read now, but from my spiritual master who says that actually such a devotee is very foolish if he thinks that by external I mean, it's good to perform external activities, of course, but what if one day you get sick and you become an invalid, or I don't know, something happens, what about then? Are you going to say you're not performing devotional service? So basically, there is no impediments to the devotional service. Actually, everything is in the mind. So, devotee like me <laughs> is foolish to think that by performing these activities he has done a lot. But if at the same time, well, while he performs these external activities, he does not internally have this mood of like, I'm pleasing Krishna, why I'm doing this, am I remembering Krishna, am I chanting the holy names of the Krishna? If that does not exist, then he says that the devotion in such a person will not appear ever. <laughs> so, that's why he's a fool. So basically, yeah. Even when you perform uh, pujari service, as I understood, you correct me if I'm wrong. My friends, before they go to the altar and offer whatever they have to offer to the deities, I don't know the details, but they have to offer it in the mind first, right? As at least they do it. They say it like that. So, so devotional service is uh, a meditation. <laughs> so it's not an external activity. Activity. According to offering Pujari service, by the way, we don't offer Pujari service by ourselves, but uh, because our Guru normally instructs and that's not we that we offer. It's our body as instrument in the hands of Guru. And also, you say sometimes we are exhausted and um, outside look, we, we perform devotional service, but our mind is not engaged. Even, even if we are engaged only externally, it's impossible when you are in love, you have to really concentrate and as you say, you lost all the items in the mind. So, you know, the Bhakti Nautaku said, whether you cut your head, but never stop your service, because Krishna is there, he waits for you. So sometimes we, we have to be able to 
neglect our body and mind, what they say to us, and to, to become on the level of pure uh, soul, which is, you know, such a demand of it. Even we, we are covered by our body, the circle and the gross body, but in many cases, like in Isco now, we don't have so much health people, and we have to continue the service as back in our history, and you have to reset yourself better to stop the service, but because it's really important. Mm -hmm. And I think devotion is said that that's one of the ways that uh, you're connected with Krishna, like living in holy place, worship the deities. It's really important, not more important than the holy name, but in the same time, Krishna is personal and direct. It's not that he's present in the deity, he is his yeah. deity. He is. Sila Prabhupada says that Krishna came here to talk to you. <laughs> and you, yeah. can, you can talk to him. Like everyone says, oh, we're talking to Krishna, to the deity, and yeah, <laughs> with whom to talk. So Yamuna Devidasa, she gave an example that she would pray every day to the deities and talk to them. And who will you talk to if you're not going to talk to Krishna? <laughs> so. oh, I also once heard Prabhupada say that if you have a problem, just go to Lord Nichananda and say, Dear sir, mm -hmm. this is the problem, um, this happening. Yeah. Krishna is so merciful, he stands all the day with the hands like that, and he listens to all the prayers and all the complaining. He's still there for us, a long time. When we're chanting, we're addressing Krishna. Yeah, I mean, he incarnated in the form of the holy name. But since we are so materially engrossed in this matter, yes, that's one, one more thing that uh, Bhakti Vinod said. Uh, yeah, even though one lives in this world without attachment to matter, still there is danger from matter. And yoga, deity worship, is a proper way to deal with matter. So, yoga is the procedure of worshiping the Lord by employing all the physical and mental faculties of seeing, touching, smelling, tasting, thinking, discriminating, and acting. So, because we are surrounded by matter, we still don't have the vision of transcendence as we should, um, then that's why we need Krishna as he is now here appeared in the form of uh, um, Mar Marble? Marble deity? Can you say that? Marble deity. But that's him. So he can turn matter into spirit and spirit into matter by his inconceivable potencies. Thank you very much for your attention. Hope it was not too much for you. <laughs> Sometimes I have a lot to say. <laughs> so thank you.
Thank you. 